Allow me to demonstrate the skill of Shaolin, the special technique of shadow boxing. <laughs> Poisonous. Poisonous paragraph, smash your phonograph in half. It be the inspector deck on the wall path. First class, leaving mites with a cast. Causing ruckus like the aftermath from guns blast. Run fast, here comes the verbal assaulter. Rhymes running wild like a child in a walker. I scored from the inner slums abroad. And my thoughts are ready to start. I slice the mic from the court. First criticize, but now they have become mentally paralyzed with hits that I devise. Now I testify, the best is I rebel like that's your highness. Bless to electrify. Hi hey everyone, so nice, windy, and sunny day today, so hopefully uh, the wind won't make too much noise in the microphone. But um, so as usual, a uh, few things we want to discuss today, usual nice three things. So first, we're going to talk about hybridization and how hybridization of culture is one of the defining features of culture and cultural globalization in the modern world. Two, we're going to question the idea which is implicit in some of what Rothkopf talks about, that cultural globalization necessarily equals westernization and western imperialism. Now, of course, cultural globalization is linked to this, but it's not clear that cultural globalization necessarily leads to the kind of homogenization and western homogenization that many critics are concerned about. And three, we're going to question the idea of authenticity in culture. So part of this discussion about culture and cultural globalization is that there's implicit, an implicit question about what is an authentic culture and when does authentic culture become, let's say, transformed or, or something different. And what we should pay attention to is that, in fact, culture is constantly being questioned and reproduced. Why are you just using the Wu-Tang school method against me? I've learned so many styles. Forgive me. So something to keep in mind from last lecture is that culture and cultural products are things that are necessarily bound in social, political, and economic institutions. And so what this means is that culture and cultural products and cultural reproduction, music, art, and so on, are intimately connected with political life. They're not just uh, simply aesthetic abstractions that we can enjoy. Rather, they tell us something about who we are and how we live in this world. So the metaphors, the frames, the narratives, and the stories that people tell about themselves and their place affect how we understand a variety of things, including migration, the Second Amendment, or sense of belonging, the ethnic borders around a state, or, or sense of national identity, and all of these issues that affect politics, society, culture, and life. So again, culture um, from Geertz, from Anderson, and, and Ipaderai, although the borders around culture are imaginary and are constructed, they still play an important part in determining how we live in the world and in society. Quite simply, culture and the elements associated with culture, symbols and so on, matter and they shape people's lives. So I want to start the conversation about cultural globalization by talking about this dish right here. So this dish features very prominently in a book on Nordic cooking called the Nordic Cookbook, which is a huge volume. It is somewhere over 700 pages of dishes that are associated very primarily with Sweden in particular. And this dish is not only um, a central dish in Sweden, Swedish um, uh, Swedish community more generally, it is also heavily featured in one of the central parts of Swedish culture, namely the Swedish Midsummer Celebrations. Now you can't really get a sense of it here, but it, in essence what this dish is, is a meat pie uh, made up of ground meat, usually beef, sometimes mousse, in this uh, pie crust with uh, cheese and sauce and seasoning kind of scattered throughout. It is baked until golden crisp, until the cheese on the top is golden and bubbly. Then after it's settled and cool, it is served with uh, chips and a tomato sauce. Now, the way you pronounce this dish, the actual word of it is taco pie. And what it actually is, is a is a 
Swedish version of taco. So usually what it is made with, the meat is spiced with taco spice mix, either in packet, um, packets that you can get from uh, companies like El Paso, or you can make it yourself, making taco spices. Fairly straightforward, cumin, uh, paprika, chili powder, um, you know, salt, pepper, garlic powder, onion powder, and so on, right? Like very straightforward stuff, really. Now, what is interesting about this is that this dish, which is, again, a major part of uh, Swedish gastronomy, it is very culturally linked to major uh, celebrations of Swedish identity, and is eaten more frequently than other well-known quote-unquote Swedish, uh, Swedish dishes or Nordic dishes like lutefisk and uh, some of those fermented fish dishes. This dish quite clearly, by virtue of the fact that it is called taco pie, I'm sure you can see where this is going, is not originally from Sweden. In fact, what it is, is pretty clearly um, a, a Swedish version of Mexican food or perhaps Mexican-American food that came over in Sweden and began to be produced most heavily in the 1980s and 1990s. Now, would we say, as people who are not Swedish, that this is definitively not part of Swedish culture, that this is not a Swedish cuisine? It seems difficult to make that case, given its centrality, again, in this book, which is purported to be the book on Nordish cooking, and the fact that it features so prominent in so many Swedish cultural celebration, so much um, elements of cultural celebration. And yet, I'm not entirely sure that we could definitively say that it is a part of Swedish culture, because without a doubt, there are going to be some Swedish people who contest whether it's quote-unquote authentically Swedish. But nor would we call it necessarily authentically Mexican. After all, it is not served in the way that we normally serve uh, Mexican food or even Mexican-American food. It is a taco served in a pie with the cheese kind of put on top. So I guess it's probably closer to a, um, like a shepherd's pie or something like that. And so this idea, this fact that you can take this product, which may have originally started in Mexico, certainly become regionalized through the border and the association between Mexico and the United States, that then travels globally, then becomes interpreted in Sweden and reimagined as a particularly Swedish dish associated with particular Swedish customs and prepared in a very Swedish way, that what we see right there is what Wang and Yue Ye describe as the localization of global products and simultaneously the globalization of local products. After all, the, the taco dish did not begin life as a American slash Swedish dish, but rather something that was regionally limited to uh, Mexico and to Latin America in general. We can enter here into a discussion about Coca-Cola and the fact that it is present in quote-unquote traditional dishes in Latin America. And in talking about the idea of traditionality in dishes, McBride notes on page 3 that quote, by traditional dishes I mean those that are part of a country's culinary heritage and be clearly and can be clearly identified as typical of that country. The addition of Coca-Cola does not change its identity or make it American. Now, the lesson we can get there in looking at how Coca-Cola, again, an American product, has become intimately linked with local and quote-unquote traditional cooking in Latin America, and in much the same way that American, the, uh, the Mexican-American taco has become globalized and linked and become part of Swedish culture and Swedish celebration, the sense what we can get there, the sense that we can get there is that the idea about what is authentic or traditional should be examined skeptically. That in fact a lot of the products of our modern society, especially in an age of globalization, although certainly before modern globalization, are in fact uh, hybrid products or cross-pollinated products in which elements of culture in this case, focusing on food, can be borrowed from one culture or one region and become internalized or, um, uh, I wouldn't say consumed, but certainly assimilated into another culture and becoming an authentic or real part of that absorbing culture. And the essence to get from that is that uh, 
rather than thinking about whether culture can be authentic or not, or pure or not, that it is better, in fact, and perhaps more useful to recognize that culture is informed by hybridity. And hybridity, um, particularly from, uh, from Yue Ye and Wang, is, is something that emerges in particular spaces. And in particular, in spaces where the culture of the self, let's say, encounters the culture of the other, and both can become transformed by this encounter and reshaped. Now, something to keep in mind is thinking about the processes in which cultural globalization takes place. And so, Apatorite speaks about scapes. And you know, scapes uh, essentially from the idea of landscape. So it's a field in which a process can can take place. And one of the fundamental things, or one of the fundamental fundamental elements in a patterized discussion of scapes that we should pay attention to, is the way in which economy and profit shapes this process of cultural globalization and in hybridization. Because something that we want to pay attention to, and I'll explain why in a moment, is that even though cultures can become cultures can become hybridized through this process of globalization, that hybridization is not something that occurs on an equal playing field. And this will make more sense once we understand what these scapes are and the ways in which different elements of power and control and authority, however defined, shape who has access to these scapes and how they are constituted and shaped. So one of which, for instance, is the role of media scapes in shaping cultural globalization. So media scapes, in the way that Apatari discusses it, is in essence the landscape of mass media, market share uh, of um, which can be affected by the market share of streaming companies in the age of streaming, access to the film market, who can produce particular films or TV or movie images and so on, who has access to internet providers and all those things that play a role in propagating the spread of media and the image and music and so on in the global, in the globalized community. Similarly, we think about ethnoscapes. And so for a Apatari, the ethnoscape is the realm in which people of different identities and ethnicities and culture can cross borders and bring with them ideas and ways of being and ways of consuming and so on. And something that we know, particularly in this class, is that not everyone has equal access to the ability to move across borders in the ethnoscape. Similarly, in idioscapes, which has to do with the range and the universe of ideas about the relationship of the self to authority, to freedom, to the state, those two are also going to be shaped by access to power and the ability to, to influence the internationalized world, or the globalized world, rather. Now, something to pay attention to in reading Apatari is that the various scapes that he mentioned, so the five scapes, right, media scapes, ethnoscapes, idioscapes, technoscapes, and finance scapes, that these scapes do overlap, but they do not necessarily provide the same kind of access to the same kinds of people in the same way. And they don't necessarily all operate um, in tandem with one another. They certainly may, but it's, but it's, not, um, it's not a given. So, for example, on page 37, Apatari discusses how um, state power in different regions can be used to facilitate movement through some scapes, but not all scapes. So, he says on page 37 that, quote, First, people, machinery, money, images, and ideas now follow increasingly non-isomorphic paths, by which he means they do not overlap and follow one another in exactly the same way. They do not increase or decrease in the same way at the same time. Of course, at all periods in human history, there have been some disjunctures in the flows of these things, but the sheer speed, scale, and volume of each of these flows are now so great that the disjunctures have become central to the politics of global culture. The Japanese are notoriously hospitable to ideas and are stereotyped as inclined to export all and import some goods but they're also notoriously close to immigration, like the Swiss, the Swedes, and the Saudis. And so the implication that Apatari is giving there is that Japan 
is open to or is more attuned and connected to the flow of culture through idioscapes and um, and mediascapes, but not so much to ethnoscapes with the movement of people. Similarly, thinking about Sweden, as mentioned before, the taco pie um, is a very strong example of Swedish openness to this cuisine from another region, right? But again, as the Paderai points out, the Swedes themselves may be less open to the ethnoscape of cultural globalization and the movement of people themselves across borders. Now, of course, sometimes these things do overlap with one another. So in thinking about mediascapes, that is the spread of the image and of um, uh, music and cultural reproduction, and, and idioscapes, that is the spread of ideas about um, the relationship of the self to authority, to freedom, and your political, um, uh, um, political engagement, Wang and Yue Ye point out on page 179, the ways in which these can work together or can overlap in productive ways, let's say. And so they say on page 179, quote, it does not take a careful viewer to notice that in the cultural blend of Hollywood blockbusters, superheroes, space fighters, young adventurers, and even the charming princes of the animal kingdom are depicted as high achievers who, rising from, the bo rising from below, play the roles of guardians of freedom, equality, and peace. And so the point there, the, that they're making right there, is to say that, as uh, that in some cases elements of mediascape, in this case those controlled or heavily influenced by Western ideas and Western money, can sometimes overlap with Western values in other ways. In this case, with the spread of ideas um, through the idioscape of uh, individualism, uh, individualism, freedom, equality and these kind of uh, Western notions of political liberalism. So the end result is that something that we should pay attention to is that cultural globalization and all of these scapes, media, ethno, idioscape, technoscape, finance scape, that these are going to be affected by major economic and political interests who are going to be invested as well as uh, people themselves and cultural movements in shaping how cultural globalization proceeds. Again, to kind of underline, this is not purely or merely, talking about culture is not purely or merely an aesthetic debate or an aesthetic discussion. It has to do with, like so many things, with the strictures of power and the ways in which social power are constructed that affect people's lives. In a more lighthearted sense, we can see I think pretty well about how these different scapes work together to produce elements of cultural globalization in thinking about K-pop. In particular, this group that I have become recently aware of called BTS. Now for those of you who don't know, BTS is a K-pop group which is very heavily and pretty clearly influenced by hip-hop that is tremendously important to the Korean government itself. So for example, there is an agency in the Korean government under the Ministry of Culture that is directly invested in promoting K-pop as a form of soft power, so to speak, for the Korean government overseas. And the Korean Director of Tourism in the Ministry of Culture, Kim gwang soo said um, very directly that, quote, I personally think that K-pop concerts have considerably contributed to making our unique tradition known to the world. Now, what I think is most interesting about that, that quote is the part where Kim gwang soo says, describes K-pop as our, quote, unique tradition. Because what I'm going to do right here is I'm going to play a clip from one of BTS's songs called Hip Hop Lovers, and this is a live performance. And as you watch this, what I want you to do is pay attention to how this group uses language and which language they use, how they comport themselves, their posturing, their style of engaging in music and so on, the rhythm of their speech and all those things, and see how these elements reference and draw from American hip-hop in the quote-unquote unique tradition of K-pop from Korea. So here is BTS in hip hop level. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
Now in this case, this part of uh, K-pop, which I think, again, you can see a lot of the ways in which this music overlaps with American hip-hop, and quite clearly BTS is aware of that by giving a shout-out to a lot of old-school and slightly more contemporary uh, uh, hip-hop uh, hip hoppers, right? Uh, something that we can think about is the way in which the various scapes, as described by Apadurai, have affected the production of K-pop and, and this uh, cultural globalization. So, for instance, in thinking about ethnoscapes and the movement of people across borders, it is worth thinking about, as we have discussed in this class, how U.S. military bases abroad and their economic contributions, so the presence of U.S. military service members, and then the emerging economy that sprang up around them, including the juicy bars and the discos, which had to bring music to attract the, um, the, the military service members, the fact that so many U.S. people were stationed abroad in the Republic of Korea meant that there was a demand in the Republic of Korea for American music to be played, particularly around camp towns and these tourist zones, as part of creating a hospitable environment for the service members. That, as well, of course, as the sex tourism and sex trade of the camp towns, which we discussed already. So that is one of the ways in which the ethnoscape of the movement of people affected the globalization of American music. Another one is idioscapes. So in the Republic of Korea, there was a military dictatorship which ended in 1979-1980. With the end of this military dictatorship, there was a loosening up of controls on what parts of culture were deemed acceptable for display in the public sphere. Now, anybody who knows hip-hop or knows the history of hip-hop will also know that 1979-1980 was around the time when hip-hop began emerging as a cultural phenomenon in the United States. So just as we have an opening up of cultural space in the Republic of Korea, we have the emergence and pretty soon the popularization of hip-hop in the United States, which again fed into the idea or fed into the demand and the ability of hip-hop to be produced, or, or imported rather, uh, into Korea and uh, played in the bars around these military bases. And then finally, the media scapes. So now with increasing access to internet, with the fact that musicians have gone on tour, including um, in, uh, uh, rappers from the 1980s, NWA, Public Enemy, rappers from the 1990s, Tupac, Dead Prez, 2000s, uh, Eminem, and, and so on, right? The fact that that we have these uh, uh, this, this access and this increasing ability to negotiate culture across borders in these mediascapes have also affected the production of hip-hop in Korea. 
So in thinking about westernization and the role of power in culture, it is definitely true that since money and political power affect globalization, and they certainly do, we can think back to earlier discussions about uh, military globalization, the role of the Western consensus in economic globalization, and so on, right? So since money and political power and military power drive globalization, it is certainly true that the West, and in particular the United States, has an outsized influence on cultural globalization. A lot of the examples that I've given so far in this discussion the role of hip-hop, uh, the role of Americanized uh, uh, Mexican food in Sweden and so on. These are all examples of U.S.-led or U.S.-dominated cultural diffusion. And some of these elements of cultural diffusion were also made possible through military occupation. So we can think again about the presence of U.S. military bases in the Republic of Korea and the effect that that has had on the diffusion of this American art form, hip-hop, into uh, as, as now an authentically uh, authentic uh, Korean pro uh, cultural product. So I got distracted by my dog here. Dog, what are, you, what are you doing? We can also get a sense of how dominant the United States and U.S. cultural products are by comparing them with the cultural products of other regions, although this might be somewhat misleading since we should take into consideration multiple measures of influence. That motherfucking rooster. So for example, um, if we think about the film and media industry, right? Um, Hollywood produces by, by far the, or, or has by far the largest market for movies and film God damn that motherfucking roost. By far the largest number of movies and film, or, or the value of the, of the movies and film produced by Hollywood by far dwarfs any other competitor. So for instance, in looking at Hollywood and Bollywood, Hollywood uh, dominates Bollywood with annual revenues as of in measured in 2006 of $9.2 billion. So just for those who don't know, Bollywood is the film industry um, based in Mumbai, largely in the, of the Hindi language produced by India, okay? So in terms of total value, Hollywood has a much larger value of 9.2 billion versus 1.7 billion for Bollywood. However, Bollywood produces more movies per year than are produced in Hollywood. So a thousand movies in a typical year um, with a worldwide audience of three billion people, including, of course, those in India, compared to Hollywood, which produces only 500 movies per year and has a, annual, and has a viewership of 2.6 billion. And so part of the reason, of course, why Hollywood has more revenue is that they can charge more um, per movie tickets, there's more merchandising and licensing fees and so on. But it is worth keeping in mind that despite the numerical size of the amount of movies produced, that in terms of share of the overall movie market, that Hollywood and by extension the U.S. cultural machine has greater sway than any other industry. And governments are in fact aware of this and once more reflecting the importance of culture to ideas of the state and ideas of belonging, uh, states that are concerned about this have passed laws limiting the um, number of Hollywood products or American cultural products that can enter into their country as a way of establishing or preserving cultural identity. So in the EU, for instance, there was there a, a directive has been passed in which Netflix, Amazon, and other online streaming streaming services have to have thirty percent of their output of uh, in TV shows and films that are made in Europe, which they must also subsidize under a law that was passed in the EU in two thousand eighteen. And this reflects a long-standing concern by governments in Europe in the EU in particular, but not exclusively France, about a concern about the domination, the cultural domination of the American product in film and media over their industry. And part of this, of course, is, uh, you know, it's worth uh, considering whether uh, American movies are just naturally better and more interesting and American film and TV are naturally better, more interesting than those in other, con in other countries. Um, and that might be one interpretation about why the U.S. film industry is so dominant. 
another interpretation, of course, should take into mind, and Wang and Yue Yue uh, talk about this, uh, something that we should consider as well is amount of financing and capital and marketing that is available to the American industry and uh, in comparison to the um, marketing and financing and so on that is available to other industries. And those are not irrelevant considerations in contemplating why the American film industry is so dominant. We can also get a sense of the concern by governments about the spread of cultural influence and the possibility of westernization as a result of cultural globalization in looking at the way that people have spoken about Coca-Cola in the McBride article. So on page one, for instance, uh, Mao Zedong described Coke as, quote, the opiate of the running dogs of revanchist capitalism, end quote, which is a fantastic quote, but illustrates, for instance, the awareness of policymakers and governmental officials about the um, let's say the ideological and the political elements of the spread of culture. Rothkopf, of course, points to this favorably on pages 42 and 43, in which he discusses the, um, let's say, the, the benefits of, um, of Western imperialism through cultural imperialism. So on pages 42 and 43, uh, on page 42, he says, quote, the in inevitably, the United States has taken the lead in this transformation, the transformation being called for globalization. It is the indispensable nation in the management of global affairs and the leading producer of information products and services in these, the early years of the information age. So they're kind of outlining what's, what's, uh, what's going on. Oh, great. So now there's a plane. Come on, bye, bitch. All right, um, right, so Rothkopf there is kind of illustrating some of what I was just capturing, right? The domination of the mediascape, idioscape, um, you know, technoscape by American capital, right? He goes on on page 43 to say, the United States dominates this global traffic in information and ideas. American music, American movies, American television, and American software are so dominant, so sought after, and so visible that they are now available literally everywhere on earth. They influence the tastes, lives, and aspirations of virtually every nation. And of course, Rothkopf is talking about this, and you can, you know, if you scroll down, you'll see the... Um, the, the size of American share of um, you know, um, certain instruments that are connected to the escapes of a paddorite, right? So, you know, Rothkopf talks about this as a good thing, right? And kind of uh, posits the westernization element of cultural globalization as a positive for uh, people uh, in, in addition to the United States. Further, it is clear when looking at the discussion of Crouching Tiger and Mulan how intensely local stories and traditions and beliefs can be affected by and reshaped by global capitalism, which again, to kind of recapture, is uh, the current global capitalist system is in large part a product of the Washington Consensus, which, as we covered earlier, was linked to um, United States and Western European domination of the political and economic scene after the end of World War II, and certainly shaped by the history of colonialism, right? So uh, the what the discussion of Crouching Tiger Milan shows is that very local traditions and stories are now being shaped and their cultural reproduction guided by this global capitalist market. Now, it's very clear in looking at Boonland, which was very heavily westernized, exactly how that plays out. And there you have this local story about uh, filial piety and so on being reshaped by Disney and the desire of Disney to sell merchandise. And you can get a sense of that in the spread of, in the, in the casting of the product, the shaping of the story, and the symbols and narratives that were present to Mulan that, as Wang and Yue Ye point out, are not present in, traditional, in the traditional Chinese story. And it's worth pointing out that even though Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, is portrayed 
as a more authentic, so to speak, alternative to Mulan, as something that's more authentically Chinese than Mulan, it's worth noting, first of all, that even that story had adjustments that were made to it, uh, changes to the script, uh, how the script was written with language that was more Western-centric, the ending of the story, and all these elements in the finished movie that were ad adaptations for a Western audience. Now, granted, Ang Lee had far more comparative space and autonomy to make the movie in the way that he wanted to make it, but what is worth uh, uh, illustrating is that this is this was an exception that proved the rule, so to speak. That in fact, the level of autonomy and support that Ang Lee had to pursue his vision and to make it as authentically Chinese as he wanted to, despite the fact, of course, that there were some changes made to it to make it more Western, that his ability to negotiate all those economic elements and strictures on uh, uh, and constraints in production are not generally shared by most people who want to make movies drawn from other cultures in the Hollywood machine, so to speak. So the end result is that this thesis that cultural globalization is simply cultural imperialism has a basis for this argument, right? And so as um, Wang and Yue uh, uh, indicate, hybridity and cultural hybridization is going to be shaped by power structures, economic, political, military power structures, all of which shape the terrain through which culture and the diffusion of cultural elements are absorbed, internalized, how easily they spread their market share, all the elements and the different scapes of globalization that Apaderai discusses. And McBride also touches on this in looking at uh, narratives and ideas about Coca-Cola and Western imperialism. Now again, there are some who look at this development and treat it with, uh, let's say, joy or delight. So Rothkopf, I think, is probably the best example of this. And he explicitly wants Westernization as globalization because he's interested in promoting imperialism, in this case in the cultural sense, for imperialist reasons. And what I think is most interesting about Rothkopf is that if you look at how he discusses the implications and the values of cultural globalization, it imbibes and uses a lot of the same kind of language and rhetoric about development, advancement, civilization, and so on, that we also saw deployed earlier when looking at the creation of the nation state and the way in which the modern, so to speak, nation state and the European ideas behind the nation state were used to justify erasing indigenous and African cultures. And so on page 48, Rothkopf talking about Western uh, imperialism through cultural globalization says, quote, Americans should not shy away from doing that, with, which is so clearly in their economic, political, and security interests, and so clearly in the interests of the world at large. The United States should not hesitate to promote its values. In an effort to be polite or politic, Americans should not deny the fact that of all the nations in the history of the world, theirs is most just, the most tolerant, the most willing to constantly reassess and improve itself, and the best model for the future. And so there what we see is this narrative of cultural globalization as Western imperialism portrayed in this case by someone who is a fan of Western imperialism. Now, there are, of course, some critics to this idea of globalization as synonymous with Western imperialism and or Americanization. Namely, and this should be uh, particularly clear if you caught that song at the beginning, which was Guillotine by Raekwon, the chef of that album, classic album, only built for Cuban links, right? Which is that non-US influences can become a part of US culture. And one of the most successful, and in my opinion, the best hip hop group of all time, Wu Tang Clan, all right? Wu Tang, which was named, first of all, 
after the Wudan Mountain in China, um, which was uh, one of the central places of uh, the development of Shaolin Kung Fu um, in the mythology of the, the, the Wu-Tang Clan. And Wudan Mountain, of course, was also referenced in Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, okay? So we have this group, this, uh, you know, one of the most successful, most important and influential hip-hop groups of all time using a musical form that was created in the inner city in New York and in particular by the black and Latino inner city in New York. And this group begins adopting some of the cultures and symbols and language from China in particular through images and language and narratives that were dispersed through uh, Chinese martial arts films primarily produced in Hong Kong in the 1970s and 1980s. And it might be worth wondering why would this rap group, why would this hip hop group draw language and symbols and narratives and stories from this from this country on the on the other side of the world, right? And in particular drawing from martial arts and Chinese Kung Fu. And once again we can understand this cultural globalization and hybridization through politics and economics. So in the inner city, in Chicago, in New York, in urban centers around the United States. We have simultaneously in the 1970s and 1980s, the decline of support for the inner city, white flight, and increasing, increasingly marginalized black and Latino communities in urban areas. Now, there's still a demand for movies. There, you have um, various industries in these areas, including movie theaters, that still need to produce content and products for an audience. So you have, on one hand, a uh, culturally and ethnically distinct audience in the inner city that is distinct from, uh, you know, like uh, the suburbs, right? Like Main Street in the in suburbia or whatever, right? Um, and you have uh, poverty and a like pretty large low income population. So the market was there for movies that were uh, low budget. If you were a low budget producer um, you, uh, that had like low production costs, you could create or, or film movies that could be cheaply distributed to an audience that could not pay uh, or, or to, um, to an audience and to screening companies that could not or were not interested in paying top dollar for big budget movies and so on. And what this meant was that there was an opening for cheaply produced films to be made and distributed in the inner city. And one that gave birth to the rise of what became known as black exploitation films, uh, films like Shaft, Dolomite, Foxy Brown, and so on, as well as cheaply produced Asian martial arts films. So in Hong Kong, in around the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, this industry began to emerge using local talent from uh, from stuntman troops, from dance troops, uh, people who had been trained in the Beijing or Peking opera to make movies that were oriented around showing the, the physical attributes of the stars, um, but were not um, very high quality or, or top class produced movies. The scripts were abysmal or uh, predictable. If they you know, even had scripts, the acting was atrocious. Um, the storylines were ludicrous, but they were super entertaining. And they often had the common story or a common story of the rugged individual triumphing over uh, injustice and, uh, and oppression to strike for freedom and liberty and goodness, right? So a lot of those themes, first of all, also overlapped with the, th with the themes of, of black exploitation movies uh, that I had just mentioned. Um, in addition, the, the, the Chinese martial arts movie industry that started out in Hong Kong tended to use a lot of 
Australian voiceovers when they were when they were uh, dubbing their movies for production on the international market. So you'd often have in inner city communities double billing, where you'd have a black exploitation film and that would have a double header with a Chinese martial arts film with a title like um, you know uh, Thundering Mantis or Wu Tang Assassin or the Shaolin Killers or the 36 Chambers of Shaolin and so on. Those are all the names of some of the martial arts movies that were brought over into the United States, in particular focusing on the inner city urban movie market in the 1970s, 1980s, and so on. And you can see some of that cross-pollination in some black exploitation movies like Dolomite, where the main character uses uh, martial arts as a way of fighting against the man. So the end result is that you have cultural products like this following video produced by the RZA. Um, so I know it from the album Wu Chronicles, but it was also a an album on a soundtrack, or, or it was a soundtrack to a documentary called Rhyme and Reason. But you can get, you know, you can just like get the single or get it. <clears throat> get it from from uh, the Wu Chronicles album, right? Anyway, so if you watch this following video, pay attention as always to, again, some of the, the language, uh, some of the elements and the, 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 the symbols and images that the RZA makes reference to. Look as well at the music video itself and the clear homage to old school Chinese Kung Fu flicks. Anyway, so here we go. Here's Risa. Hang up in this joint. Wu Tang forever. Wu Tang. Wu Tang. Wu Tang. Wu Tang forever. Wu Tang forever. Wu Tang forever. The Risa rap in your sector. From Shaolin to the holy city of Mecca. Yo, yo, assassination, vaccinations, poor education, infatuation with Satan, with global nation, taxation, Bible optic, microscopic, biological germ, bad child, burglar on the market, captain of your starship. I never departed once I started to explore these regions that was uncharted. Leave your heart broken. Yo, I stand tall like builders on Van Dykes or Mike's. Be strike like a noisy four train late night. Jace got New York for the life we out of state. Can't smoke a bone in the staircase without getting chased. Pretty candy poisonous rap. Best to chill or get your head gas, lemon head, sour patch kids, best to grab a lightsaber, I drug break ya, boss to bake ya, then plant my sunflower seed on every square acre. The beauty of my nature so through your crazy I mecca. When I make myself equality, known to my reflector. Stay in your playpen, boy, and battle for your formula and cries. You pass the finest lullaby from the black butterfly. Control this metamorphosis as the king takes his office. Keep my planets in orbit, never forfeit or quit. Move forward, I talk with the awkward slang. I walk with the Wu Tang. Heavy thoughts can't be held down by the laws of gravity. Watch for the llama in the temple trying to plot your tragedy. A game rank with the high. All right, all right. And this idea of this cross pollination of cultures, in particular between Chinese. Uh, and Asian martial arts and Kung Fu culture and black culture is has uh, been memorably parodied in the Chappelle show, um, which had this following clip on this imaginary racial draft in which people from different races can draft all the people from all the races into their own uh, cultural group, which, you know, obviously is kind of... Um, you know, a little bit a little bit ridiculous, but gets to this idea of cross-cultural appeal and the hybridization of different cultural elements with uh, with other uh, uh, other cultural elements so let's take a look at this clip right here and you know just kind of pay attention to the idea that the Chappelle show has about cross-cultural uh, competence and dialogue <laughs> Good evening and welcome to the first and maybe only racial draft here in New York City. Folks, 
This is for all the marbles. What happens here will state the racial standing of these Americans once and for all. That's right. And the crowd is here to support their races. Well, Rob, some of the biggest names in sports and in entertainment are on the line tonight. And I'm excited to see who's going to be drafted by which race. Seated behind me on the stage there are the various representatives. And believe it or not, the blacks have actually won the first pick. Oh wow, that's the first lottery a black person's won in a long time, Billy. Yes, and they'll probably still complain. <laughs> <laughs> Man, fuck you. Well, the black representative is heading to the microphone now. Why don't we take a listen? We in black delegation. Rob, thick thighs, no felonies. She definitely would have been a great pickup. Okay, the Chinese delegation is up next. Although they're the last, they've been waiting with Zen-like patience. My guess is Yao Ming. He's been spending a lot of time with blacks learning slang and shit talking. If they're not careful, they might lose him. The Asian delegation chooses. The RZA, the JZA, the bar, the Spectre, the Exposed Killer, the Wu-Tang Clan! Oh my God! Oh my God! What I have just heard with my own two ears. This is by far the biggest upset of the night. The Chinese delegation pulling a fast one and choosing the entire Wu-Tang Clan. Brooklyn! This is big for us, Jokers. We always been a fan of the Kung Fu and the Chinese culture and shit. So, yo, it's like bong bong, you know? Yeah, I want to um, remind everybody to um, diversify y'all bonds. Um, Rizzo got an announcement to make. Oh, yeah. Old Dirty has now changed his name from Dirt McGirt to the Old Dirty Chinese Restaurant. <laughs> You need you why, bitches. Folks, thanks for joining us on this incredible night. Our coverage ends here, but be sure to catch the rest on our website. Congratulations to all of the races and Konnichiwa, bitches. Another thing to pay attention to is that Western products can become recultured when they travel across borders. So, first of all, in going back to thinking about Coca-Cola, as McBride indicates, the flavors of Coke and how Coke is sweetened is not, in fact, universal. It's not homogenous. So, we have this product which is very heavily associated with American ideas and American imperialism. However, when it moves across borders, it changes to adapt to the local market, to local tastes, to local production, and so on. Similarly, we can see the same process in other cultural artifacts like McDonald's. So if you go to a McDonald's in another country, you might not get the exact same menu as you would with McDonald's in the United States. I don't even know if you get the same McDonald's menu in different parts of the United States, but that, you know, that, that's kind of outside my expertise. What I do know, however, is that if you go to the McDonald's in Jamaica, you can get a jerk burger. So it's like a hamburger just with some jerk, flav uh, jerk flavoring, right? And that same idea, I, I, and the reason that we do that, of course, is that um, you know, pe people in Jamaica like jerk chicken. So the tendency is to want to produce goods, granted this, this American good, right? Produce it and repackage it for a different audience. And so there's something unique and, and kind of localizing going on about this, uh, around this product um, as it travels across borders. So again, the localization of the global. Okay. Similarly, if you go to McDonald's in Egypt, which I also remember, you could get a falafel burger. Okay. If you get a McDonald's in India, and I'm sure that the McDonald's in India, I'd be very surprised if they had beef burgers. I, I seriously doubt it. I don't actually know, but I seriously doubt they have beef burgers available in India for obvious reasons. So what that tells us is that even the things that we associate most heavily with Western imperialism and Americanization can become transformed when they move across borders. So this 
idea of cultural hybridity and hybridization is not just a one-way street. And so the end result, or something to keep in mind, especially for those of us who are worried like the EU ministers who established limits on American cultural television and cultural products, right? For those of us who are worried about cultural globalization being another tool of imperialism, in this case cultural imperialism, something that we, we might want to keep in mind is that, is that first, what we consider our own authentic quote-unquote culture is not something that has been static, that has been free of outside influence and cross-pollination, uh, cross two, that in fact the Western culture or the American culture, or however you want to interpret it, also has adapted and become transformed by encounters with non-American culture, right? And three, that as a result, um, we don't necessarily have to fear the erasure of the authentic and the replacement of it by the homogenized imperialist culture um, because this process of transformation is, is, um, is, is bidirectional, right? Now, again, to reiterate, this does not mean that cultural globalization is free from some imperialist tendencies and does we do have to grapple with the fact that the West and America dominate in all other areas of social political life and therefore also dominate in culture, but it's not quite there there's a lot of space for pushback against cultural imperialism and homogenization. And so we can think about McBride and Wang and Yue Ye, who say uh, um, on page six and page 190 respectively. So here's McBride. McBride says, in the last paragraph, certainly Coca-Cola is a cultural reference shared around the world, but seeing it strictly as a symbol of cultural imperialism is to deny what cooks in Colombia or the Philippines have made of it, a homogenized aspect of their cuisine as much a part of their culture as their own. And that, of course, as, uh, comes from the story about adapt, uh, adaptation of Coca-Cola in what is now considered traditional dishes. So here's Wang and Yue Ye. Uh, on page 190, they say, quote, to label a cultural product fake, in disguise, or authentic, presumes the existence of a standard prototype that simply does not exist. And then in speaking about Crouching Tiger and Chinese movies, the Chineseness of these cultural products lies in their ability to identify with and attract viewers in contemporary Chinese societies themselves the product of constant change and hybridization rather than in a faithful reflection of stereotypical images of feudal China. We are reminded by Ulf Hanners that cultures are by nature fluid and are always in motion as a result of continuing interaction both from within the culture itself and with the outside world. And I do want to point out to one final thing from Rothkopf because I found this particularly interesting, right? Which is that, you know, again, like listening to McBride, reading Apadurai, uh, reading Wang and Yue Ye, what we see is a constant argument, a constant statement that cultures are fluid, that they change, that they are constructed, that they're performed, that they become hybridized by encounters and so on, right? Now, interestingly, Rothkopf, makes that same observation about American culture. So on page 48, he says, quote, uh, no, yeah, it is page 48, okay. So he says um, on page 48, American culture is an amalgam of influences and approaches from around the world. It is melded consciously in many cases into a social medium that allows individual freedoms and cultures to thrive. Oh my goodness, that sounds so, so wonderful and, and uh, enlightened. Now, what I think is interesting about that is that Rothkopf makes that argument as a reason about why American culture is great and should be exported and is universal. This idea that it is a product of mo many cultures encountering one another and, um, and, and developing into some new product. But what he does not seem to 
willing or capable of recognizing is that you could make that same argument about every culture around the globe, uh, particularly in this currently globalized era in which you have the vast movement of ideas and images and people and narratives and stories and philosophies through the mediascapes and idioscapes and ethnoscapes and technoscapes and financescapes that Apaderite talks about, every culture currently right now, except for probably some of the most isolated cultures, um, are also amalgams of influences and approaches from around the world that have been melded into a social medium. So this is not new to America. It's not something new to America um, or, or unique to America, as Rothkopf seems to suggest. And it would be interesting to see whether he would revise his central thesis if he accepted that the cultures in other places that he disparages are also hybrids and capable of change and, and growth and flow, and in fact, perhaps not that distinct from Western culture itself. And so the takeaway from all of this is that it is clear that cultural globalization and hybridization has been accelerated in the modern world. So think back to the previous lecture and the discussion about uh, the internet, the role of mass media and mass communication in propagating ideas, uh, of, um, the spread of information, the spread of uh, technology, the spread of uh, financial flows and so on, right? It's definitely been accelerated. Uh, second thing to pay attention to is that the economic, political, and military domination of the world by the West, and in particular the United States, undoubtedly gives support to the idea that cultural globalization is necessary, necessarily Westernization. However, we should be aware of the limits of that argument and recognize that not only is there space for non-Western cultural elements and cultural products to shape uh, cultural globalization and to, in fact, drive globalization in, in uh, the Western world, but also that defining authenticity and therefore defining what is the barrier between Western culture and non-Western culture is harder than you, than you might imagine. Because culture is a contested product, continually evolving, and the barriers between one culture and another are not necessarily so easily defined. So it's a very complex and nuanced uh, discussion. We should pay attention to power and the way that power shapes globalization, but it's not the only factor that affects cultural globalization. All right, so that's going to be it for today. Thanks, guys. And uh, we'll see you guys uh, later today and some of you all tomorrow. All right, bye.